So today I'm hoping to help you demystify a bit about Spiffy and how it can solve Secret Zero or what some people have uh, talked about and, and, and mentioned as the bottom turtle problem. Um, maybe a lot of people already might be using Spiffy. Um, it's the underlying technology that is powering the identities within Istio Service Mesh, for example. Uh, quite recently, Linkerd has announced support for it as well. Uh, Cilium is using it for their uh, mutual authentication and authorization system. So more and more systems are starting to adopt it. But like, I'm trying to wanting to dem demystify a bit around what Spiffy is. Um, Spiffy is a workload identity um, thing. And to be able to talk a bit about workload identities, we kind of need to go back to a higher level. And like, where then Spiffy is a potential solution. And like, you kind of have two kind of identities. Uh, you have machines and you have human identities. Human identities are well understood. And you have countless solutions that help you solve the management problems of them. Examples are uh, Google SSO, Enter Active Directory, uh, Okta, and all of these kind of solutions. But the lesser known identities are the machine identities. Machine identities exist out of two categories, device and workload identities. For devices, think about TPMs that you might even have on your laptops and other solutions. But with the sprawl of microservices, we have seen an increase of workloads. And it is important that we can uniquely identify workloads to be able to govern and authorize communication. Research has proven that machine identities will outcompete user identities with 45 to 1. Currently, there doesn't really exist many full-blown solutions to manage those workload identities. And we get a mix of secrets, API keys, tokens, certificates, JWT tokens, or even cloud native or cloud solutions that give you the workload identities. But they're not very much compatible with each other. It also makes it very hard to govern and manage them. So why should we care? And this is the reason we should care, by, because of this man, Aristotle. An entity without an identity cannot exist because it would be nothing. To exist is to exist as something, and that means to exist with a particular identity. So that's why we care about workload identities. So the purpose of this talk is to guide you through the basics of the Spiffy framework and showcase how it can help solve your secret zero or bottom turtle problem. But let's start at the beginning. What does Spiffy actually mean? Spiffy stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. It's really a mouthful. <laughs> it's an open source project designed to establish a standard for securely identifying and authenticating software services in a distributed and dynamic environment, such as cloud native and microservices architectures. The project aims to provide a framework that allows different services to securely communicate and trust each other identities without needing to rely on traditional network-based security mechanisms like firewalling, uh, IP table rules, and all of these kind of things. Joe Beda, who is one of the co-founders of Kubernetes, first proposed Biffy in 2016. At the time, Joe was still at Google, and he refined that specification of Spiffy framework with security experts from other organizations like Netflix and uh, kind of like these kind of big organizations, with the aim to have an interoperable framework for workload identity management. There is an actively maintained open source implementation of the Spiffy framework, which is called Spire. It is actively maintained by many organizations, and we can see public use cases of the Spire usage from the likes of Uber, Bydance, and many others. There are some really great blog posts out there from Uber on how they are running Spire at scale. And it's definitely worth doing a quick Google search on this to like read them like they're very well in depth. Uh, Uber talks about how they run Spire at scale. They also talk how they use it together, for example, with Kafka for author authorization to Kafka services, like very interesting blog posts. So over the last two years, we have seen Spiffy taking up a lot more traction. First and foremost, Spiffy itself is fully open source. It's part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and it's a graduated project in there. We've seen um, it's being adopted by and standardized on by the industry. So like, for example, Azure has announced that they're working on a product for Spiffy. Google is working on a product for Spiffy. And AWS has already support for like Spiffy uh, workloads. 
more on the AWS use case even later during uh, some demos that I have. So we also have seen that due to the failure to protect identity leading to supply chain attacks, like SolarWinds was a really great use case. So like it's becoming more and more important to be able to uniquely identify all of your workloads so that like you can protect them. And also regulation and zero trust mandates play into like this uh, more awareness around Spiffy because like Spiffy can help with like your zero trust strategy. So it's all fine and well that we know this what Spiffy stands for, but what problems and challenges we face can Spiffy actually help us with? So the first use case and probably the one I get the most excited about is removing the need for API keys. Imagine a world where you no longer need to have long-lived API keys or tokens. You don't have to deal with securely storing them or having a find a way to retrieve them from your secret store, which on its own also requires an authentication token. One of the major hurdles of adoption for Spiffy will be to make your application Spiffy aware. There are some great SDKs out there in the different uh, programming languages to help you make that really quickly to implement. If you can change your applications, for example, with databases, you can always opt to put a proxy in front of it that is Spiffy aware. Like really great use cases of proxies are uh, the Envoy proxy, of course, which powers like service meshes like Istio. But there is also, for example, a really great proxy for Pro PostgreSQL that already has Spiffy support as well, for example. A second use case is to authenticate from one cloud to another cloud through the usage of Spiffy. An example of this could be that I can write a file to an AWS S3 bucket from a Google Cloud instance or even from an on-premise VM. And the third use case is to give all your steps in a CI-CD pipeline a unique identity that can help with auditing of your software supply chain and you would be able to use your Spiffy identity to authenticate to your signing provider and then sign your release artifacts or any evidence that you provide as part of that release artifact, like a uh, software bill of material, an SBOM. So implementing Spiffy is a major step in your zero trust security story. By giving all of your workloads, applications, and machines a unique identity, this Spiffy identity allows you to do explicit authorization between your workloads. By using your Spiffy for authorization between workloads and services, you prevent that API keys can be shared between multiple applications without your knowledge. I've seen countless times where one API token gets shared between 10 different applications, making it impossible to track where a request is coming from. By using Spiffy identities, it allows you to have an improved auditing system on your authorization layer, as you can explicitly lock from which Spiffy identity a request is coming from. On the previous slide, I talked about that you don't have to think anymore where to store your API keys or have a way to retrieve them. A Spiffy identity in most cases will be automatically provided as part of your platform where your application is running on. A great example of this is Kubernetes. When your application runs on Kubernetes, the platform team can automatically provide a Spiffy identity to each workload running on Kubernetes. This makes the life easier of the application teams as they can focus more on adding extra features, improve reliability and security as well as other levels of their applications. One of the big challenges with long-lived secrets is that in most cases a regular manual rotation is required to stay compliant with policies and control. Spiffy takes this all away and it's even recommended to have short-lived Spiffy identities of between one hour to 24 hours maximum that automatically get re renewed as well as rotated. So this is a quote from Joe Beda again and it summarizes exactly on the previous items we talked about. It's very important to deliver a great developer usability experience to improve the rate of adoption. Spiffy is also a solution that works everywhere on premise and in the cloud, serverless and in mainframes. And the advantage that Spiffy gives on observability and policy enforcement are unprecedented. So we now have talked a bit about what Spiffy is, the problems it can help solve. Spiffy is an open framework with its specification published to GitHub for everyone to see, use, and implement. We are now going to get into the depth and you're going to discover how a workload can get a Spiffy identity and what a Spiffy identity actually is. So 
to be able to uh, demonstrate this, I have created a small architecture of two servers with each of them two applications running on them. And as part of this, we're going to now start with the current status quo that we probably all know, where we have a secrets manager, manager running somewhere that can be HashiCorp Vault, that can be like one of the cloud providers that have the secrets manager. So the way this kind of works is application B, for example, will retrieve a secret with its client ID, and then it will initiate a connection to application X, and it will send over the client ID that application X then can help verify. With that, of course, application X only knows that the connection comes from a customer that has this client ID. The client ID can be shared between multiple applications without the knowledge, so you cannot be 100% sure that this connection comes from application B unless you're using IPs, but like we all know in clouds, IPs change quite a lot. One of the other downsides as well, this connection is not secure. It's not MTLS or uh, TLS encrypted. So the Spiffy framework exists out of five distinct components, and each component has, has its own function. And like, as part of like this presentation, we're going to go over one by one. We're starting with the Spiffy ID. To a human, that is comparable to how our name and how we are called. So the Spiffy identity looks very similar to what a website URL would look like, and it exists out of the following. The standard scheme that identifies what follows will be a Spiffy identity. The second part is a trust domain. This is the to identify distinct domains of trust. One enterprise can have multiple trust domains. A common example is to have a trust domain for production and another trust domain for development because you want to keep them completely separated and not necessarily trust each other. But even in production, you can have multiple. I've seen, for example, if you want to have distinct trust domains per data center. For this example, we're using venify.com as our trust domain. And the last part is the path. And that's how we identify our workloads. Each workload should have its own unique path. The path can be a unique UID that's being randomly generated, or a more meaningful one, as this is the case in this example. We can see our workload runs in data center one, on node 10, and it's a web server of the front end. So that's like allows us to uniquely identify our workloads. So we're back to our application, and we have removed the need of our secrets manager, and now application B gets a spiffy identity. We can see it's spiffy, venify.com, server one, application B. And application B is sending over its identity to application X. And application X can verify this, and it can, uh, auth like it can authorize it based on that spiffy identity. So we know that application, B is co uh, that application X gets like a connection from application B. One of the downsides of this is still like our Network traffic is still not encrypted because, like, it's an identity. In essence, it still can be forged. So that's why we need to go to the Spiffy SFIT, the Spiffy Verifiable Identity Document. It's comparable to our passport that we carry around, and that's how we can, for example, we can get verified at the border control. So a Spiffy Verifiable Identity Document, or SFIT in short, is a cryptographically signed identity document that can be used to verify the identity of a workload within a specific trust domain. It's a fundamental component of the Spiffy framework, which aims to provide secure and standardized identification and authentication for services in distributed and dynamic environments, such as microservices architectures, as well as like cloud native applications. Currently, JWT tokens and X509 certificates are supported as cryptographic key materials, which can cover a lot of use cases and also, like the, all these keys should have a short lifetime that in case of compromise, the exposure is very minimal. Uh, this is an example of a Spiffy SFIT X509 uh, certificate. And in there, you can see in the URI part, can, you can see the uh, Spiffy identity in there. So like this is the SFIT, and that has the identity encoded in it. And it's signed by our CA, which then can be trusted in our environment and is kind of encapsulating our trust domain. Uh, Similar example, but with a JOT token. And again, we have our Spiffy ID in the JOT payload. 
So we again have our uh, application on two distinct servers. But now instead of just sending over the SPIFI identity, we're going to send over the SPIFI SFID as part of an X519 certificate. So application B is again initiating the connection to application X. And this time, we're sending over the public key of our X519 certificate, which has our SPIFI identity in it. And application X can verify this based on the common root of trust based on the CA. And it verifies this, it, and it authorizes this. And from now on, our connection is MTLS secured as well, because it's the public key. You can start uh, doing MTLS with that one. The biggest missing things after all of this is how can we get applications as PFS fits um, from our central system, and how can identities be issued in a trustworthy way? And this is where the workload API comes in. Like requesting our passport at the passport office, we need a way to get a SPIFI verifiable identity document for each workload. And this is done through a standardized API, the workload API. The SPIFI workload API that preferably runs on a local socket or at least only listens on local host of a node as it's unauthenticated, this API is the way to retrieve SPIFI SFITs. It is responsible for the automatic renewal and rotation of our SPIFI SFITs as we want them in short lift. It is quite common for a SPIFI SFIT to only be between 1 and 24 hours of a lifetime. The workload API allows you to create integrations for your different platforms that deliver SPIFI SFITs directly to your applications on a well-known location. Currently, it already exists for Kubernetes, but imagine a life that wherever you run your workload, you have a SPIFI SFIT, no matter where you run from AWS Lambda, functions to on-premise VMs to even mainframes. The SPIFI workload API is an unauthenticated API endpoint, and hence why it only should be uh, reachable locally. It's also responsible for validating and attesting the different workloads that run on that node. This happens out of band. Otherwise, we wouldn't really be solving secret zero, but more on the attestation and verification later. We are now back to our two servers, but this time we have added the SPIFI agent which runs locally on each of the server, and it exposes the workload API through a local socket on that server. So application X will never be able to reach the workload API on server 1, for example. It will only be able to reach the workload API on server 2. So we are going to request a SPIFI SFIT from the workload API application. It's going to get validated and attested in the background. Again, more on that at the station and verification process later. The workload API is going to issue an SFIT for application B, and application B can then start using that one. We're repeating the same process for all our other workloads so that each of them have a unique identity. And then we're doing the exact same thing as before. Application B is initiating the connection, and it's sending over the, con over the public key, which application X can then verify, and we're still MTLS. So, we now have solved almost all of our problems, and the only problem is remaining to be able to attest and verify that we can issue X519 and JOT certificates through our workload API. We can get SFITs from a central place, but we also need to make sure that those workloads are what they say they are. The verification of workloads can be happening in band, as that would require API keys, and we wouldn't really be solving secret zero or the bottom turtle problem. Verification and attestation of workloads need to happen out of band and asynchronous. Verification and attestation happens at two levels. First, we need to trust our node where the SPIFI agent is running. And then after we trust the node, we can start trusting the workloads running on that specific node. And to be able to build up that trust, we need to gather evidence of the environment the nodes and workloads are running on. For nodes in cloud providers, for example, this can be done through querying the instance metadata, which is locally available to each um, EC2 VM or TCP VM, retrieving facts about it, and then a central system can verify this information out of band. In on-premise system, this can be done, for example, through TPM or other environmental verifiable data. Once a node is verified, the workloads are running on a node can also be verified. This is again done by verifying the environment. Proof can be gathered there, for example, from the Windows or Unix sockets, or when running 
on in Kubernetes by gathering proof from the Kubernetes API through the kubelet, for example. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about an example of this again uh, to kind of make this better graspable. So we have now added a spiffy server as well as a node uh, at a station endpoint um, from our spiffy server. And our spiffy server is also the one that controls the issuing CA for each of the X509 and SHA tokens that are going to get issued. On the servers itself, we also have like a node at a station and a workload at a station process running that help with that. And, and the way this kind of works is when a spiffy agent comes up, for example, in server one, it's going to gather some proof of node and it's going to send some proof of node to our spiffy server. Our spiffy server is going to validate that information by doing its own checks, like for example, by querying the cloud API endpoints and val validating that the node is with it says. And it's going to then issue a spiffy identity for the server. It's going to send this back. And the reason that the spiffy agent also gets its own identity is that from then on out, the communication between the spiffy agent and the spiffy server happens over a secure connection based on that identity as well. So like all communication between the agent and the server after its initial verification is happening over a secure connection. So we now have like an identity for our servers. Now we can start verifying our um, workloads. We send a request SFIT to the workload API. And the spiffy agent is going to verify that like, it can issue an SFIT for our application based on Unix uh, processes, or like for example, when it's Kubernetes on the Kubernetes API, querying that again, verifying all of that information. And it's going to then issue uh, an identity once it's verified. And from then on, it's exactly the same as, as before. Like we send over our certificate, we validate the connection, and it's still like secure. So, we now have like actually solved the true secret zero process that can be used for uh, multiple use cases. One thing I still want to talk about a bit is uh, Spiffy Federation. Um, it's a more advanced topic, but like I still want to briefly uh, talk about it and, and very high level cover it. So Spiffy Federation is important when you run multiple Spiffy servers or multiple trust domains. Uh, a common scenario is to have like a Spiffy trust domain per environment. But uh, in certain cases, for example, you will have like development and production. But you might have a shared environment that then needs to be able to talk to both dev as well as production. Like think about CI CD servers, for example. So you want to federate the shared with production and the shared with dev, but not dev with production to be able to have like distinct domains and, and like reduce the blast radius. And that's when we need to start thinking about spiffy federation because Two workloads from different trust domains still sometimes need to be able to talk to each other. So each distinct spiffy server must have a trust bundle endpoint that can be queried by other spiffy servers. A trust bundle, it's comparable to a CA root chain that publishes the public keys of that spiffy server. When spiffy servers want to federate and trust another spiffy server, they need to explicitly define it in their config. And based on the refresh timings that are set in the trust bundle, the spiffy servers knows when to requery the trust bundle of the other spiffy server to get an updated one. By using those uh, timings or those refresh timings, it will allow, allow like the different spiffy servers to do rotation of their CAs as well in a uh, nice way without causing downtimes. Uh, the three most common use cases for federation is to segment environments with different levels of trust, as I talked about with the shared and the production and the shared and the dev, for example. A second use case for spiffy federation is between different companies. It is similar to the first one, as federation will happen between different uh, spiffy deployments, but there might be difference in implementation and administration of the spiffy framework. And the third and final use case is to en enable consumers that don't have a spiffy set up yet. People without it can fetch the trust bundle and use that to authenticate their callers without having to commit to a setup of a full-blown spiffy deployment. And like for this start setup, this is for example how you can do federation with like lots of cloud providers. Lots of cloud providers support OIDC, Open ID Connect, and Spiffy or the open source implementation Spire supports this so that you can do the federation with like a non-Spiffy full-blown setup. Um, afterwards, the Spiffy server is responsible for distributing the trust bundles to each workload 
so that the workload can verify the spiffy as fits from another uh, spiffy server. This was a very high level overview. And we're back to our application. This time we have two distinct spiffy servers. We also have added a trust bundle endpoint. And server one will uh, get like be part of the trust domain of spiffy server one, while server two will be part of spiffy server two. And you can see each of them have their own CAs that are not linked together. They have their own trust domains. So by default, they wouldn't be able to talk to each other because X509 certificates wouldn't be able to trust each other. So what happens is when we define in our spiffy servers that we want to trust each other is that they're going to query the trust bundle endpoints of each other, and they're going to retrieve those trust bundles. And then afterwards, they're going to distribute those trust bundles. It's a bit of a simplification, but this is kind of how it works. And then we get like our spiffy identities again, like by doing all of the normal rounds that we talked about earlier. And because even though they're in sp different trust domains, because the trust bundles have been distributed, like application X again will be able to verify and authenticate and authorize this connection and set up MTLS even though they're uh, part of, of separate trust domains. So I'm going to do, try to do a small demo. It's going to be very basic uh, on like showcasing some of the, the, the Spire stuff kind of thing. So if I... Um, so Spire have, uh, is an open source project, um, and it's part of the, of the Spiffy community. And what they have done is they have created a Helm chart uh, for installing Spire. And I kind of wanted to quickly uh, take you through some of the things. Um, this is like my Helm chart, and you can see it's, it has quite a lot of information. Uh, it's mainly exposing some of the um, uh, domains that I have running, like for example, I have Thornjack is, is a UI, for example, for it. Uh, although, like, it's a very basic UI for Spire, but like, it shows you something. Um, like, for example, here you can see that I also uh, expose my OIDC endpoint and and uh, set up TLS for it. And then also one of the things I do is, is uh, as I talked about, the workload API runs on a socket. I rewrite the socket to a specific socket. And the reason I need to do this is to make it work with Istio, for example. Istio works together with Spire, and, and I'll show that also uh, a bit later. So once after running this kind of thing, what you get is uh, Spire running inside your uh, Kubernetes cluster. So this is my Kubernetes cluster. And what you can see in here is uh, I have my Spire server. Currently, it's not highly available set up for production use cases. I suggest to do that, of course. And we have a Spire agent. Uh, and the reason I have two Spire agents is when I do kubectl get nodes, uh, you will see that I have two uh, nodes running in my GKE cluster. I also have two CSI driver ones. These are the ones that make it easy to map the workload API socket within my uh, Kubernetes pods. And again, more on that like in a bit. And uh, I also have the OIDC endpoint and, and the Thornjack kind of one running in there. So to be able uh, to showcase this, I have a Spire tool server set up uh, within my Kubernetes cluster that has the workload API socket running in them. And if I now uh, run the Spire agent, and I'm running the command Spire agent API fetch. So I want to get my identities. And I want to write my identity to uh, the temp file path, and I define the socket path. So this is the socket path where I can get my workload uh, from. So when I do this, and I run this, uh, it has like done the validation in, in the background and the attestation in the background. And it has uh, gotten my keys and written them to temp. So when I now do um, this one, the bundle, and this is the CA bundle, you will see this is my uh, trust domain, spire.internal.matchsgs.be. And uh, it's signed by itself. It's a self-signed one that I have like currently using because to make it very easy. But one of the things I can also showcase you is this one, and here and you will be able to see here, uh, this is the spiffy ID of my workload. Um, it's quite hard readable, but like you can see, for example, it's uh, my trust domain is uh This workload runs in the namespace default with the service account default. 
and you saw me uh, getting into the pot, it was running in the, in the same namespace. One of the thing, nice things you can also do is you can add extra DNS entries to it as well. Like you can see here, it has a full pot name. Uh, in a bit, you probably see later in the demo that it can also have like service names for internal Kubernetes ones. Like it's, it's fairly uh, moldable to do that. One of the advantages of being able to add this extra information is that you then can use this as well for uh, applications or other things that don't support Spiffy yet, but can work with like uh, certificate aut authentication, um, like databases and stuff like that. Uh, they, they support it by default. So, uh, I'm, and for the last bit, I'm talking a bit about Istio. So, Istio natively can work with Spire. So, Istio has its own uh, workload identity generator, it's part of Citadel. But it doesn't necessarily do the same in-depth attestation and validation. Then what? Uh, it's it's really simple attestation and validation. Spire can do way more in-depth validation of it, uh, and that's like you would be able to replace this. And it's it's fairly easy to do this. You can see here. I need to inject some sidecar webhook, and um, besides that, like it, it's 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 a very basic config like. I deploy my ingress gateways. They also have like those uh, workload sockets in there. Um, and after I've deployed uh, my bit, I can. Uh, so this is an Istio CTL command to retrieve some secret and the certificate from it. And uh, this is a uh, an is my, the, the standard book info application that I have deployed. And you can see in there that it's like runs in the namespace book info with the book info details. And it's also quite clear in there that the extra DNS name I was talking about earlier, like all of like it has services in front of it, so I have auto populated them. Uh, this is all possible with like the, the, the Kubernetes integration, and it's very easy to start playing with that one. Um, Spire itself um, is, is a really great open source project, but when you start running it in production, it has certain challenges. It store it needs requires a database, so by default it uses a, 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 a local file database, but it needs to be SQL based. So you can back it with uh, PostgreSQL or MySQL for high availability if you have high availability requirements, and it requires a bit of setup and understanding to to start running that. Uh, but like as I said, the cloud providers are working on support for that. There are a few other startups that are working on it. So there is at this moment quite a lot moving in that space that hopefully is going to make this a lot easier uh, to run. And soon I will also talk a bit about like how to make it, uh, how to get like something more simpler running than Spire. Um, also like before ending this talk, I have also one more quote from the head of security and CISO of Notable. For him, Spiffy is a game changer. And it really helps in simplifying TLS distribution uh, to hosts. Um, to end this talk with a bit of a summary, uh, Spiffy provides foundational identity. It's going to reduce the need for API key distribution. It's going to give you short-lived identity that automatically gets renewed. All of the attestation and validation of your workloads happens out of band. It is hopefully going to make the life easier of developers, like they don't need to go to Secrets Manager anymore, uh, populate secrets in there. Like It's something that should be foundational on your platforms. And Spire is an open source implementation of Spiffy. I also promised that I'm going to make it a bit easier to get started with Spiffy. Um, two weeks ago, I did a webinar uh, with, uh, for the CNCF where we demonstrated how you can use Cert Manager Cert Manager is uh, the de facto kind of certificate management tool within Kubernetes, and it's very easy to set up. And Cert Manager has simple support for Spiffy. It doesn't have support for the full spec, but it allows you to get Spiffy certificates. And um, together with another open source tool called Authorize, you can use that to fully set up the authentication authorization to AWS across clouds. Um, this is the link to the webinar page. And in that webinar page, we're talking you through like how Cert Manager works together with Authorize. It also has a demo that you can fully replicate. And what is this going to do is, uh, it's from Google Cloud, for example, from a GKE cluster, you can talk to AWS S3 without needing to do anything. Like it automatically gets like an AWS authentication. It all sets this up, and all from within Kubernetes. So after the initial setup, 
together with other eyes, like all of your workloads are getting a specific identity thanks to Cert Manager. And then Authorize is doing the authorization bits to AWS, like you add some annotation to your workload, you uh, declare an intent in your Kubernetes cluster, and that intent in your Kubernetes cluster will automatically set up, for example, the AWS IAM policies for you uh, on the AWS side, and this is all can then natively happen within Kubernetes. And this works m in a pure multi-cloud one. Unfortunately, this CERT Manager SPIFI implementation currently only works with AWS. As AWS is, at this moment, I think the only cloud provider that allows authentication with X509 certificates. And CERT Manager currently only does X509 certificates. If you want to do, make it work with other cloud providers, you need to more look at JOT tokens. And then you need to uh, look at Spire at this moment. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming here. And uh, I'm open to questions as well. So if you have any questions, I'll pass the mic over to you so we can record it. When you had the two different servers serving trust domains and they would swap the uh, trust bundles, how can they authenticate the other server's trust bundle if they don't have a shared cryptographic source? Um, so the trust, like if, if I go back to the to this uh, thing here. So what the retrieving of trust bundles does is it gets the public key of the CA, and then the public key of, of the CA then gets distributed to, uh, for example, the Spiffy Server 1. Uh, Spiffy Server 2 retrieves the trust bundle of Spiffy Server 1, and then it uh, populates the public key of uh, the Spiffy Server 1 in here. And because you then have the public key, you can verif do the verification of it. That's true. So, yeah. So, so yeah. So the question is, can this uh, trust bundle distribution endpoint be man in the middle? If you don't use an HTTP con HTTPS connection, yes, of course. Like you might have, like for example, other means already of like public key distribution in your images, for example, where you have like a CA thing. Then you can, of course, put it in front of HTTPS, and it's it's a lot harder to uh, man in the middle that. So it can be an HTTPS endpoint to your trust bundles, and as long as you then again have the trust some in, through some other way, uh, yeah, this can be secured, and you can get rid of man in the middle or prevent it. So you mentioned this makes the developer life easier. What does this look like? So I know where to get my passwords. I know how to generate one of those. Yep. How do I generate a spiffy? Uh, uh, address or specifically um, ID. So that that's indeed where like Spire, for example, comes in, which is the the production ready implementation of the Spiffy framework, or like Cert Manager with the Cert Manager CSI Spiffy store uh, Spiffy driver that generates those Spiffy IDs for you, because like a big part of of the Spiffy identities is also doing the verification and attestation of that. You would be able to mint your own X509 certificate kind of in a manual way, and you would be able to do the own verification attestation and then just mint with the Spiffy identity in the right place on that certificate, of course. That would be the very rudimentary way. But most of the, the cases, like you're going to go to an automated way and, and look at like tooling like Spire and Cert Manager, as well as like the, maybe the cloud providers that are coming that are going to give you that Spiffy identity that you then can use for authentication and authorization between different workloads. But like, it's indeed, it's, it's a great question. And um, like, I've been thinking quite a lot around like, from when does it start paying off having Spiffy everywhere? And like, because you, for a really long time, you're going to have like both of the solutions. And one of the nice things, for example, is HashiCorp Vault. As an example, as I know it's a very popular uh, secrets manager, supports authentication with Spiffy. So like a, a really great way, for example, to start is, especially when I look at VMs, VMs don't have like basic uh, identity, like HashiCorp Vault with Kubernetes cluster can already be used through the, the JOT endpoint, but like VMs don't have this. But once you have like Spiffy, for example, on your VMs through like a system like Spire, you can already authenticate to a HashiCorp Vault. 
and then slowly start chipping away kind of thing and, and getting rid of secrets and doing, going more spiffy native. But like there is for quite some time going to be uh, a time that you're going to run dual kind of thing. Can I use can I use Spiffy in a mobile mobile app uh, to um, have the mobile app identify and uh, authenticate with uh, the server? S sorry, what was the question? Can I use it in a mobile app? Can I configure it in a mobile app on, on a phone to uh, have it authenticate itself and exchange uh, trust information with the backend, with the cloud? Um, nothing stops you because, like Spiffy itself, is a framework, so. And like we've been debating about it, like can it, for example, be used for user identities as well, and where your user gets a certificate? And in theory, it's possible because it's a specification. Uh, I haven't seen it done like as an actual implementation kind of thing, or like any of the open source have have implemented this. But like I don't think nothing stops you from kind of doing the development or like somewhere, and then. Doing it out, I, I think it probably would be a nice MVP. Or yeah, the thing is that uh, right now, for example, you know, I have to get a token. You know, uh, can, if, if I can, if I can go away with that, I'm going to have to get the token myself and generate the token. That would be, you know, that would be helpful. Yeah. So as of about six months ago, HashiCorp Vault doesn't exist really for a lot of us anymore, at least not as an open source project. So are there any open source secrets providers at all that can be done with Spire? Um, one of them actually is quite recently, and, and I'm not sure how that's also like what, what the future is of that since the acquisition, but uh, VMware created VMware Secrets Manager, which is powered by Spiffy for authentication in the background. And uh, it would be an alternative. I really haven't really tested it, but I've seen a bit of like buzz around it, and and, and I really need to test it out, as like uh, the people that created that are very active in the Spiffy community as well, and and it sounds like a quite neat solution indeed, like where you need to run uh, Jewel. I also know there are some efforts on having like an like an open tofu for HashiCorp Vault, but like, yeah, I I haven't really looked into that story, so. <laughs> VMware thing you said that, that that's a replacement for Spire or it's actually just a secrets provider that Spire can work with uh, so so it's a secrets manager that is uh, natively using authentication of, of on the spiffy site so it works together with Spire natively for example is, is it yet another piece in the Tanzu product portfolio yeah but like it, the, the VMware secrets manager itself is fully open source and, and you can run it without being as part of Tanzu uh, I forgot where you mentioned there was a, uh, a database uh, that the users. Where is that in the agent or in, or uh, in the It's server? in the Spiffy server. So the Spiffy, the, server. the Spiffy okay. agents itself are fully stateless. The Spiffy server, uh, or like the Spire server, because Spire is a production grade Im implementation, is has a database. Uh, of course, like there, like the Spiffy itself is, is a framework, is a spec. Um, I know, like again. Knowing a bit about what's what's being built out there, not all of them are going to have a database on on the on the on, on their Spiffy server, but Spire definitely has a database. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. They were really good. <laughs>